Would you like to know what it takes to be a professional slackliner or entertainer? Check it out on this episode of How Not To Highline. Hi, I'm Ryan Chinks and welcome to Your Ray, Colorado, where we decided to talk about what it takes to be a professional slackliner. I was talking to Marcus Nelson here about what it takes to do trick lane uh, not competitions. Trick line and high line performances. Performances. And uh, it was very interesting about how much to charge the business side of being a professional athlete, not just a slackliner, and seeing um, kind of the, the business side of things. So mm -hmm. this is going to be more podcasty, so bear with us. Um, so you have spent many moons on cruise ships. Yes. Yeah. How'd you get into cruise ships? So yeah, way before I did cruise ships, I did all sorts of little steps towards performing. So I did concerts and music gatherings and fairs and outdoor uh, sporting events that had like kayaking and mountain biking, all sorts of different things like that where there were different performance-based activities that people were watching, whether it was uh, music or um, slack lining or anything along those lines and okay. there were different stages and different things set up and there's all sorts of events like this whether they're fairs or local events or corporate yeah. events or school based events like, you always slack lined in that yes context. yeah, okay. yeah so my performance art is slack lining that's the one that I've always been involved in I can do a little bit of other things here and there maybe trampoline or juggling or handstands but the one that I, I specialize in is slack lining and is trick lining just more visual in a small space than just slack line or mid lining? Yeah, so it, and that's kind of a great question. When you first look at them, right? Trick lining is more visually appealing, like right away. It's yeah. Like you're doing flips, you're off the line, you're in the air. If you have a fall, sometimes it's like violent or aggressive or quick, right? And the most space you need is like 100 feet. And you're only using the middle of the line. So you could have a 100 foot line, but I could have. 15 foot by 15 foot padded area that I can trick line over. So a lot of it's a lot of the anchors and stuff are behind curtains. Right? Behind curtains and they're high enough maybe people can walk under them. If you have airbags at certain places right. where you're performing, people can walk under the line without even touching it. So there's ways to kind of conceal some of the the equipment and only use a small area to put on like a very visually appealing performance. So what I want to talk about in this episode is not undervaluing yourself mm -hmm. but also not missing opportunities and exposure that you might get where you would kind of be willing to work for free right and i've struggled that like oh i don't want to have fomo i don't want to miss out i'll do it for a hundred bucks exactly yeah and it's then super common what is a common day rate for a performer is it 500 bucks a day or 200 what is it that's a that's a great question i think there's like there's a lot of things that go into that question right and if you're just learning how to perform and you're just getting into it it might be really appealing to take a cheap job or maybe your job says like there's gonna be a thousand people there you're gonna get a ton of exposure people are gonna follow you on instagram and ask your name da 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 da, da right always stroke your, there's ways your to like insta ego there's ways to like feel <laughs> like oh maybe this is a good idea for me but you gotta like take a step back. And if this episode's about like the business side of things yeah. and not how to become necessarily a performer, but what do you do when you're trying to charge as a performer, right? How do you orient yeah. that side of your business? And you gotta look at all the different elements that come along with that. Cause you need to eat. You can't, <laughs> you can't wait for 10 years to get some big contract and get your movie. Exactly, and that's a great point. If I'm trying to build a lifestyle where I can be available for weekends on a moment's notice and I can drive places that are out of the way to do a performance and I can be training and sleeping and eating right right and doing all those yeah. things if I'm trying to build a lifestyle like that I can't charge nothing because yeah. I'm not going to sustain myself yeah and so you have to 
you have to like reevaluate what what am I really paying for? Am I, pay, I have to pay for my health insurance. I have to pay for my car insurance. And I have to pay for the slackline gear that wears out over time that I'm training on consistently. I have to pay for the healthy food I eat and all these other things that you know we, we're all aware of. You have to train. And you have to train you, many hours. <laughs> yeah, to you get can't to that just point. oh, when it's fun. Yeah, you have to like actually train. Yeah, exactly. So, how do you? Without giving away your trade secrets, <laughs> where the hell do you find gigs like this? Like, I don't not, I don't trick line, and I have other things to do. I'd rather go paint houses for a living if I need to go make money because sure. that's what I'm used to. And that makes money. And that makes money. Uh, it's very, I don't know, quantifiable. It's like, oh, you want the outside painted this thing, five, you know, five thousand dollars. And how do you make that and, number? And other no. people who paint, they might paint for $25 an hour because, oh, fuck their boss, and they're only paying me 15 And it sounds like you're making a lot, but then you realize you're being called back for mistakes. You have to pay for the tools. It actually, what people without licenses in painting actually start to charge what I charge, 50, 60, 70 bucks an hour, which is a normal licensed contractor rate. And and they don't have a license, right? So they, they start by undervaluing themselves. They're trying to push their way up, but all their clients up to that point are used to them being cheap. Exactly. And they wouldn't have hired an unlicensed yeah. contractor and pay full price. So you can't charge $100 for a cruise line gig and then charge $1,000 the next time because you realize, well, oh, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> yeah, if you start at a certain level and the people that are hiring you expect someone to be able to perform at that price, yeah. And then I come and try to build on that and say, oh, you know, I want three times as much or whatever. Yeah. You're not going to get hired. Yeah. And you're, not only are you hurting yourself by valuing yourself very lowly, if you yeah. realize what's gone into it, the many years of practice and not only being a slackliner or not only being a hand balancer or whatever, but being a performer in that art, yeah. there's all sorts of other elements that have taken a lot of time to develop and you got to value that time that you've put into it, right? It's pretty niche what you do exactly it's pretty niche what i do but it's like i don't trick line there are a lot of trick liners but not a lot of people who train hard to entertain exactly and if i think a trick is really hard and it makes me happy when i land it but it doesn't look very good to the crowd yeah that doesn't matter yeah and yeah the, and the audience is really what is creating your value if you're yeah. providing entertainment to the audience you're creating value if you don't know how to do that and you're a good trick liner, you're still missing certain elements of the puzzle. So by the time you build this whole puzzle, right, you figured out how to entertain, you figured out how to, to yeah. be a performer, you have to value all of those aspects of that. The gear that you know how to use, the rigging of it, the, the wear and tear, the gas that it takes to get to the place, the hotel for the night, the yeah. food that you're eating, yada, 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 yeah. down the line, right? And so if I charge $500 a day, someone might say, whoa, I don't make $500 a day, at my nice desk job yeah. and it's like but you also have benefits and you're working every day of the and you year. get paid and you get paid for five days and you get in paid that week consecutively over yeah. and over and over and it's consistent yeah and you know that it's going to be there at yeah. the end of the week when you get paid and so that's another element if you're working for a month I can value myself a little bit lower knowing that it's a consistent pay and that I'm going to be paid for a long period yeah. of time yeah if I'm working two days I can't undervalue myself for two days. That two days might not come back up again. Yeah, for a weekend, you have to be, you have to walk away with at least a grand. But yeah, if absolutely. you were to work all month on a cruise ship, you could walk away with five grand, work every day, and all your- Your food is paid for. Yeah. Your gym membership is paid for. Your sleeping quarters are paid for. You have a community of people that are fun to be around and that you like yeah. living with. So like there, there, right there, that's thousands of dollars a month, right? Worth of, of value. like entertainment, community, living expenses, yeah. gas money I'm not paying for. I don't even need health insurance on the cruise ship. They pay for that. I don't need car insurance on the cruise ship. They oh, pay wow. for that. So all of a sudden, like, yeah, maybe it's only five grand a month. But compared to me trying to land four or five gigs a month outside of that and oh. paying all those expenses, it's, it's very different expenses. How long is a cruise ship um, contract where you actually stay on the boat the whole time? So typically they're around nine months or longer, nine to 11 months, Wait, almost a whole year. You live on the boat the whole year? Yeah. And you, I mean, you, you get train off. for about two months in Miami. You, you learn the show, you learn show. all the choreographing, okay. the costumes, the timing, the whole show, you train for like two months. And then wow. you get on the ship 
and you live there for nine months. Is that why you van life? Because before <laughs> COVID, you, you you only needed a van. You in your friend's you're house. van lifing literally as much as I van life because it's about one month in Moab a year. <laughs> yeah, and then you could go perform on a cruise ship. Huh. And your expenses are wow. are minimized. I knew you did cruise ships. I did not know you spent a freaking year on them. Yeah, a long time. Wow, I get too motion sick to spend that long on a boat <laughs> or a day. Um, where do you find these gigs? Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, let's backpedal yeah, to like yeah. the smaller gigs, right? Um, and that comes down to marketing yourself. There's there's this balance. If I want to charge ten thousand dollars for a day, I can't market myself. No one, no one would buy that, right? They could go hire some other entertainment industry and get more value than I could provide them for yeah. that. Right, so I try to balance that, and I figure it out. I need this much money to travel, and this much money for food, and this much money for my hotel room, and I'm buying gear a lot, you know, to make yeah. sure I have good gear and updated gear. Adding all of those into like an Excel sheet, then you think about what do you want to be paid per day, and you add that on top of all the other things that are happening. Add yeah. a little bit of wiggle room, and you're you're and you have you're, a good equation, right? And you're calculating whether or not they're covering the food and covering the hotel. Yes. But if you have to, this is the rates. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And that's all communicated. That's like good stuff to, to be aware of. Yeah. It's very easy. And I went through a large period of time doing this where someone would say $200, $300 for this thing. Come do this show. You, you drive away there. With nothing. And you realize at the end <laughs> of it that like I just paid money to go do a show for people because yeah. all these other expenses were not taken care of, right? Yeah. And a lot of people, um, I know a lot of the audience is not slackliners since we do climbing videos and just brake tests in general. But if you slackline or do, I don't know, performances of any sort, don't undervalue yourself. So I just found out Bray also gets paid to trick line and does gigs. <laughs> he doesn't do cruise ships, but uh, what do you do? So I do amusement park gigs, actually. Oh. So it's kind of the same thing where we're forced to be there nonstop. It's full time and we do a certain amount of performances per week or per day. Okay. Do you travel for that? So I didn't have to travel. My amusement park was actually at a set location similar to what you would go to as a kid. Roller coasters, Ferris rides, that sort of thing. And at the amusement park, they actually had a theater. And in the theater, that's where we did our performances. And this is near where you live? This was actually in Santa Clara, California, at um, California's Great America. Okay, and how close is that to OMB? That is, park? it's pretty far. So it's okay. closer to San Francisco. Got so it. I'm more in like the Santa Cruz area of Northern California. Gotcha. But there are actually trick line gigs in Southern California as well. Okay. You live in Colorado now. Living in Denver, Colorado for the last six years. Do you do gigs there? I don't do any gigs there. It's very surprising. <laughs> I would have thought that there'd be so many gigs in Colorado, <laughs> but for some reason, every gig I've ever had has been out of the state. So, so you travel. <laughs> are the gigs you get... Do they cover costs and then pay you a day rate? Or do you try to like package stuff together to charge them more? Yeah, absolutely. It totally depends. I'm kind of my own manager in these situations where I need to not undervalue myself. I need to yeah. make sure I'm getting the right amount of money for the job. And that comes with housing, that comes with food, that comes with travel, and of course, the performance pay. So if you're not willing to cover travel, if you're not willing to cover housing, I'm going to need to up that performance pay. Did you start? When you started, did you under... Uh, Definitely undervalued myself. Yourself. For sure. There were maybe three oh or God, four... <laughs> <me to trigger. laughs> it was, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> one of the first... Like, the first three or four gigs I did. Okay, yeah. I want to say the first one, I may not even gotten paid for it. Yeah. They were like, yeah, we'll pay you. And <laughs> me being just the nice guy, I never pursued it. Yeah. I don't think I ever got paid for it. And I'm still kicking myself in the butt like, dang, I did a lot of work for nothing. Like, yeah. So. And it's fun to trick line, but it's also a job. Yes, You're absolutely. You're to entertain people. For sure. And that's the whole thing is it's easy for people to take advantage of you when you're doing something that you enjoy. But at the end of the day, it is a job. It is taking time out of my day. It's taking effort. It's taking skill. So it's only right to ask it to get paid. And especially with travel, you end up losing a day to get ready, a yes. day to travel. 
two days to do your gig, a day to travel back, and you're like, oh, I gotta catch up on chores. And so true, so true. Just the amount of traveling I've done, layovers and airports, and spending yeah. the night at airports. So I'm just like, oh God. Like, yeah, like a two day gig could take a week of your life. Absolutely. So if you if you made 500 bucks a day, cool, you made a thousand bucks in a week. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> And if you worked that hard doing <laughs> anything... I could make more McDonald's, to be realistic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think they're paying $13 an hour now. It's like, <laughs> you know, like... So, yeah. Um, but you've been doing this for how long now? Yes, yeah, so I think I got my first paid slacklining gig maybe three years ago, maybe four years ago. So a couple years after I started tricklining, and I just happened to get seen at a competition. The guy was like, hey you look awesome let's take you around and from that i was able to get more opportunities meet more people and have more connections okay so networking really helps are you able to charge more because you're bray yeah that's an interesting <laughs> question am i able to charge more because i'm bray um <laughs> you know i'd like to say yes or do you just get more opportunities i think that i tend to get more opportunities just from networking from knowing people from pushing my skill level out there and pushing my desire to want to work out there yeah that's also but you're always in the constraints of budgets <laughs> you <Yeah>. know yeah. <laughs> which is the hard part people are always like well we don't know if that's in the budget yeah <laughs> and it's oh. like well <laughs> a lot of people will bullshit you to say it's not in their budget and they have the budget it's really in the it's budget just the way they bullshit you. <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's what i learned is it it really takes a little bit of aggressiveness on the actor's part or you have to be willing to say no you do and walk away from gigs. You have to be willing. Now, of course, you yeah. don't want to. You have to be willing. <laughs> yeah. I actually walked away from a gig because same situation. They undervalued me. I asked for mo more money. They said it wasn't in the budget. And I said I wouldn't do it. I walked away. And they actually came back and said, you know what? We can't hire you this year. But we are guaranteeing you next year. And we'll make sure we have the funds for you. So... Well, they apparently did not have the money in the budget. <laughs> they actually they did. Were right. They actually didn't have the money in the budget that year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but hey, it's good to know that you're not working for free. You don't want people yeah. getting rich off your back. But of course, again, you don't want to be an entitled piece of shit thinking that you're the only trick liner out there. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a fine line you walk. It's like, hey, I'm Bray. Hire me. Pay me all the money. It's like, Maybe I should check my ego a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, so. I know Andy's got cool opportunities, but they really weren't going to pay that much. Yeah. Um, I remember right, he was offered a job with Madonna after the yeah. Super Bowl thing, but it wasn't enough money to give up a year or two of his life. Yep. And you're like, well, why would you turn Madonna down? Well, like, if you're going to give up one or two of your best years of your life... It has you to be. You have to make more than minimum wage. Yeah, it's got to be worth it. You <laughs> yeah. know, absolutely. Especially yeah. in this sport like slacklining where it's physically demanding as well as mentally demanding, you know. And you know as well as anyone, just getting out there on the line yeah. is a stressful factor. And performing is a thing. Doing your best trick doesn't always make the audience love you. <laughs> so I true. I am not a great <laughs> highliner, but I just did a TV show with these guys about highlining. And so it's not about just who can walk. It was about story and sharing what is slack life. And so I felt like I could do that. Absolutely. And absolutely. And that yeah. was one of the biggest things that I was saying is that everyone has something to offer. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest crowd pleasing tricks is actually taking whippers. Yes. <laughs> you know, like Samuel Bowler was telling Mia when they were in China, he was doing all these crazy freestyle <laughs> tricks and all the Chinese people would just be like, hmm. Then he would whip and they'd be like, oh, and go crazy. He's like, yeah. well, I guess whipping's the best trick. Yeah. And so You have to learn an audience. You have to learn <laughs> a whole different thing. I think running a business is different than slacklining. Performing is different than tricklining. And uh, it takes time to build that up. Absolutely. But, and like you said, knowing your audience and knowing what you have to offer is key. Yeah. So um yeah thanks for sharing and, yeah absolutely definitely uh, what's your next project do you have a gig on the books or so my next project is going to be doing tiktok videos okay so find me on tiktok at bray slacks if you want to learn some basic uh how-to videos super short super short yeah. 15 to 20 seconds just stuff not to do stuff to do little tips little tricks little fun moves so I landed my first butt <laughs> bounce today because he helped hold my hand. Yo, that was pretty yeah. sick. Actually. You killed it. I, 
I butt was, to see and feet to butt. Yeah, I was scared because there was just pine cones everywhere. So, yeah. So that was awesome. I might actually uh, try, if I can get some pads, actually try to watch that and Hell yeah, man. give Trick Lighting a try. I have done gigs that are, you know, some pay more than others. Um, I watched when Kim and I were together, I watched her try to get gigs and some paid thousands of dollars for three days and others paid freaking nothing. Exposure. And exposure. You get a YouTube, you get a YouTube call out or Yeah, Instagram we'll call post, you out right? or we'll yeah. tag you and you end up working and man, the, the social media age has really diluted people's value of niche skill sets. Exactly. And it happens in many different performance arts specifically where you have a niche skill set. Yeah. And when you really think about it and look back at the big picture, it takes a lot of effort to, to create that skill set. Yeah. But then they'll come along a younger generation or a, a less mature or less understanding generation that is trying to make money in the performance arts and they'll take something that's way less than that is yeah. valued in the market currently. So it's like, I'll give Marcus a shout out on this channel <laughs> for underpaying him to do this interview with me. <laughs> yeah, and luckily, luckily this doesn't <laughs> violate my ethical code or you know take too much time, so I don't he mind. Was, he was bored in the cabin, we're stuck together <laughs> while we're doing this TV show. How long have you been doing performances? So I've been slacklining for 10 years and about, about two to three years into it, I was really big into competing. And at that point in time, I started working with Josh Bodwin. You can find him on Instagram, Slackline Josh. And he is, he was like Slackline mentor for me. Okay. We went and performed for schools and taught kids. And I've, I've probably taught over 10,000 kids because of all the events that I've worked with wow. Josh. He's probably taught 50,000 or 100,000 different kids how to Slackline. And we've performed in front of hundreds of thousands of people throughout the years wow. between concerts and cruise ships and different events that we did. I love that. I like um, the fact that you're sharing slacklining with the world. That's what the YouTube channel is basically about. Exactly. How yeah. not to highline as a foundation and we're branching into climbing and arborists and caving eventually. And, and, and it's, business and performance. And Yeah, literally. And it's fun to share highlining as, hey, I'm a highliner who does these other things. Mm -hmm. So more people understand what's slacklining. I'm so tired of explaining it to everyone. And that's another reason I think we all signed up to do the show. Yeah. We at the bottom core got an opportunity to share slackline with tens of millions of people. And Which we have both done through other mediums already. Yeah, yeah. so like it's already something we do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just about money. You don't, on the other flip side of things, don't want to be an entitled piece of shit who thinks you're worth more than you are. More than you are. You yeah. are doing a niche sport that literally has few opportunities. Thousands few of people can do for the hundreds of opportunities that are out there per year. But you can actually build a name and a brand for yourself. I think Lucas Ermler has done that, mm -hmm. where people want him to speak. They seek him out now. And so you... Yeah, and there's a couple that are along that line that I can think of for sure. Yeah. Really like, talented speakers, really talented slackliners, and, and... So your name, you can build your name through these exposure things, but you don't want to undervalue yourself and build a reputation of being too cheap. Yeah, so, and I've done kind of steps of that performance ladder for a long time. I've done everything from like street performing to working on like a with big like production show with where the hat every, on the street yeah ah, literally go set up a slack well? line no not really <laughs> trick lining better than than other but you can do all sorts of things and it's honestly really fun and really good training if you are a performer try it out it's really fun you just go to a park you set up a hat you set up your little your little stage make sure that you know the city regulations some yeah, cities yeah. are totally fine with it other cities, you have to fill out a permit. Some of the permits are free. You just have to put your name on it, print it out, so that you have a performance uh, permit. It depends on the city, but look into it. Set up a little hat, say donations, go practice your juggling routine or your tumbling routine or whatever it is. It's yeah. a great way to learn and practice and build that exposure and understanding of what your value really is. But when it comes down to bigger contracts, you need to think about a bigger picture. What are you really paying for? You're probably not working a regular job and working on a cruise ship. Those are two different things. You can't do them simultaneously. Yeah. So you have performances, which is kind of what they are, but commercials apparently are where the money is. If you're going to do a commercial, it could take two, three, four, five days and they'll pay royalties and, and just thousands of dollars just yeah. out the gate. I, 
um, cover, um, come visit California gig. Um, we kind of missed that opportunity because it kind of ended up in junk email. And uh, it was 50 grand. And you're just like, oh, fuck. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing where if you have a good performance yeah, thing the, going for you, you land so one or two of those a year. You're set. And you're pretty set. You can yeah. then go do a local thing at your friend's bar downtown and charge them very little, right? You Words. could get away with that and you wouldn't feel so bad about devaluing the whole Painting the whole group. a house it's gonna range from 50 to 100 bucks an hour, right? There's price and there's terms and you want me to paint and sleet and snow, like it's gonna cost more out of exactly. town. But there's a range and it's for the time it takes to do a job. With slacklining, I've learned that a three day gig for the right person can land you 10 grand. It's, it's true, it's fair. And that's, that's where it comes down to weighing yeah. every situation because maybe you really want to perform at this concert, right? And so the value of that concert to you is a little higher in general Maybe I'd only take, you know, I'll, t I'll do it for five grand instead of six grand or something like that. I still have my baseline covered. I can get there. I can pay for my food and my hotels and I can walk away and put a little bit of money in my bank to save for the next time I come back, right? And you're also, while you're doing all that, hustling for the next job. Exactly. You're literally a freelancer. Yeah. Independent contractor. And those are, those are all things you want to take into account. You want to have like an Excel sheet thinking about what do you want to rent your gear as? If you think about the price of your gear, how many times do you know it's going to be great? It's not going to see any damage. How much do you want to rent it for? And then you got to think about hiring your friends to perform with you maybe. Maybe you need yeah. one more slackliner or one guy that does some music or some lights or something on the side. Yeah, what are you going to pay him, right? And don't charge the company what you pay your friend. Oh my God, there's always soft costs. Absolutely. So and you if tell the company yeah. you're buying a sound guy for $400 and you pay the sound guy $300 or whatever it is, you have built in yeah. padding for all of those I've different learned elements. You just don't bring it up. You say, I will give you a package of sound light two performers so we can take turns. You can only perform for five That's minutes a at point. a time. And I'll provide my own insurance, my own this and my own slack lines, my own rigging cert, all like you like this package. Yeah. That's when you start charging more. But if you're like, I just labor. I could do stuff. Yeah, I'm no. a and just like pay me, you yeah, know. You gotta sell yourself. It's like a I've learned all this through just personal experience. I don't have any business background or the yeah. ability really to to market myself in like a very professional way because I don't have a background in business and marketing. But I've learned a lot of you these learn. things yeah. through doing performances and through doing slacklining. And I've learned exactly what you said, that all these things I'm talking about with a bunch of different elements and making sure that I'm going to pay myself for the gas and the hotels and the food and have that all covered. I'm not necessarily pointing that out to what I'm to the person that I'm selling the contract to. That's too many details. It's too much for them to look at. They just want to see like, it's four grand for these two days. I have two slack lines, two performers. It, that's and, it. And done. they don't have to think about anything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, YouTube. We'll bring that up real quick. You're supposed to funnel people to your website and then have them go through your website and buy your book or buy it's your, great your product. Strategy, right? It costs too much money to print these hats. It, it's like, I didn't write the bolting Bible for a hundred people to, to read it. Like the whole point was, my, that was my way of giving back instead of rebolting an area, yeah. was to teach as many people as possible how to rebolt properly. And so, the donation-based style that I've done this whole channel and website on has paid off in, in gross. It just, it's amazing how That's many so cool. people have supported the value I mm -hmm. have. Like, I value myself, but I also value the information. And there's so many people in other countries that need to benefit from this information as well. I'm not trying to just withhold it for everyone who's got white or European privilege, right? It's like... sure. I want everyone to grow evenly in the slack line and climbing world with information. Yeah, totally. And that's and a really cool mindset because it's, it's like you have the ability to present this information and you know that it holds value and you value yourself yeah. and the information that you can spread, but you know that it's more valuable to just give it to everyone. And then anyone that wants to support you in your mm -hmm. endeavors with education can help donate and can help do that. And that way everyone gets the information, but you also get value out of it in return. I have finally a few months ago hit for the first time where all the expenses to run this channel, and I mean, I break a lot of shit besides the things I'm trying to break. Absolutely. Are covered by donations. And, and it actually frees me That's up. Amazing. To, That's so amazing. To do this kind of full time, 
Like I might paint like 10 houses a year to just live off bare bones, but I can actually stop painting full time because I don't have to pay out of my pocket. I paid out of my pocket for four years to do this because I believed in it. Mm -hmm. So and there is- it, Just like any other hobby, right? And like, and just performances too. Like you have to invest yourself into what you're doing. You don't just get to show up as a top paid performer. And, and so yeah, you have to present them with value and right? one to three percent of people donate that watch the channel and if you watch all the videos and read all the books and you really benefit from them spot me 20 bucks right yeah and you feel i think the more you get engaged in the content that you're creating or whatever value someone is giving the more engaged you are with that the more i feel good about giving money towards being engaged in it if i feel like yeah. i really learned something from all the information you gave out it's like, oh man, I feel like I owe you 10 bucks. It's not maybe a good business model, but I'm like, if <laughs> reading about bolts was interesting for an hour for you and you're not going to go bolt, <laughs> cool. You know, don't forget to flush the toilet. You've been on it for an hour uh, and, and great. But if, man, you learn how to bolt stuff and it saved you a thousand dollars in mistakes and you've yeah. been watched all these videos every night for a month because COVID, <laughs> it's nice if people just for $20 chip in because it literally will pay because now I can get a dynamometer that reads 100,000 times per second, drop test tower, buy, literally buy shit just to break it. Totally. When I get home, I'm breaking totem cams, totem cams. Mm, it's just too, cool. it's too small of a company to just like kind of give them to me or whatever. Like I literally had to buy them. But I'm like, oh, I really want to know it, how strong the two lobes are. And I feel like I can do that because people donate. My YouTube business model is super unique, whereas um, a performance, TV is kind of like, TV is going to give you what they give you, um, and commercials is where you make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if you want to pursue something, pursue a real career, <laughs> and on the side, pursue slackline stuff. For you, it worked out because you were not too worried about gaps in between jobs yeah i would say in general if you like want to be a performer and you want to work towards that finding those middle grounds and ways to get your foot in the door while still doing other things is really important if you want to go train in the park for two hours and you could put a hat on the ground and actually see what tricks people do like and how the audience really does react that's really good information for you if you then want to further those skills towards entertainment and you're not wasting your time because you're training in the park and maybe you made 50 bucks by People watching and giving you five bucks here and there. That's really great. That's really cool. And you can do that while you do other things. Yeah, yeah and then, that's important. And then from there, you can then build up and get your foot in the door other ways. Call your local yeah. fair. Call your local outdoor music festival. Send them videos that you know yeah, make are real. impressive for you and for that have reacted well with the audience in the park, wherever, right? Send them those videos and then give them a reasonable price. Give them something that to you covers all your bases. Don't undervalue your whole market. Don't undervalue your friends that are doing the same thing. Make sure that you're covering all your bases. You have a little bit of padding on the end there. Give them yeah. a real price. And if you actually have created enough value as a performer, you'll get calls back. People will reach out to you. You'll want to be in places because people saw what value you had to offer. And build a resume. I like exactly, what you said. Like, exactly. That's huge. So That's actually huge. when I get home, I'm going to put a spot on slackon.com for just about me or Ryan Jinx or something. That's basically my LinkedIn. It's, it's going to be just all the little slackline gigs I've done and see if I can get commercial gigs. Yep. Because if the exposure from this TV show actually happens, then I want somebody to be able to find me. If they're like, oh, that guy looks like a nerd, we want him. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to be unfindable. And so, yeah, a resume of anything you've done, street performance even, it doesn't have to be a, an official gig. Yeah, and having your different um, social media things and different things kind of linked to each other is nice, having like a link tree or something like that that kind of puts all your information together in one place is nice. I have yeah. like a little website that it's not very public, it's not very easy to find, but I can send it to people when I want yeah, to. Like a business card. And it has a list of all the events I've worked. It has things from all the way back to like 2012, different music festivals and things that I've worked. It also has a little album of pictures that I've taken of highliners and of different events and different things that I've done. And having something like that makes you all the more legitimate. It's like yeah. having a LinkedIn if you're uh, working a desk job, right? It's like having a portfolio if you're an artist. It's the same thing. If you have a list of the stuff you've done, 
you can showcase your value, other people that have been happy with your value, you're more likely to get a foot in the door and you're more likely that people are gonna take you seriously. So you've done a few slackline gigs where you were paid. Is that just China or have you done other things besides those China projects? I think I've done a few between like some rigging gigs, uh, the one in Russia. What was Mostly the one in Russia? The two skyscraper, it was a Guinness, Guinness record, oh. for the highest urban line, which was pretty funny. It was an epic line, but it was a paid gig. Okay. Um, Who else? paid for that? Who's the clients in that case? I think that was, the actual city of Moscow. Okay. Yeah. And who determines the rate you get paid? Do you have negotiation power when it comes to that? I think for most of the projects I've seen, like if I was interested enough to take part in it, I would yeah. decide like, you know what? When do you get the chance to highline in two skyscrapers <laughs> in Moscow? I would go, f I would probably pay for my own flight to go. And when they said that they were covering it because it was through the city of Moscow and it was making a little film documentary, like, I'm not going to argue the price. I'm super stoked to go, and I just went. Yeah, I I would almost pay to do an urban line because they're... exactly. <laughs> so there's a balance between knowing your worth, charging enough, and not missing out on some sick rad stuff. I feel like that's a tricky balance in slack lining because we always want to go do things, and when it's, you know it's a cool project, you just want to go, and most of the time you probably pay to go do it, and it's a weird thing to figure out the rate, that rate ratio of, is it work? Is it your own project? I don't know. So China was, what was the job? What was the gig? I think to entertain I, a bunch of Chinese people. China, in China, most of the time it's more of like a TV thing, but it's more of like, I guess they really promote a location using slacklining and they, to have it on TV so people will see it on TV they'll want to go to those locations and kind of promote kind of the area and I think that's you talk, have to talk to uh, bah, what's his name Anthony uh -huh. Newton to really know more of what that's about but I feel like most of the things are really to promote a location and they use slack lining as a show as something to film or something to kind of be interesting for that location like people will see it they'll want to go walk around the park or the, the area so how Instagram blows up areas. They're trying to do that intentionally. I believe that's the <laughs> idea of it. I'm not entirely sure. Usually I was just all super stoked to go see a cool place in Slackline, but I think that's the general where where you, way to get their money. Where you did it was beautiful, and they were trying to show it off to their world. I believe so. That's my, my understanding. Did you that. have any negotiation power for that gig? Usually, or I was always going there as a Slackliner. Usually... Um, SDD team would go and rig and do all that stuff and they were the negotiators. We would come up um, so, and slackline and they kind of dealt with all of that. So SDD did all the negotiations and said, this is the rate, do you want to show up? To, to me. Yeah, to yeah, you. Basically, that's yeah. what they said. Yeah, so if you have that layer in between you two, you mm -hmm. just, it's a yes or no. Exactly. Whereas sometimes you have negotiation power. Sometimes you have to like not ask for too much. Yeah but you don't want to undervalue yourself and be like, oh my God, that sounds fun, I'll do it for free. Yeah. Because then we'll never build this fort up to be an economical resource for people who want to make it a living. Yeah. And that's the trick. Um, it's hard to make a living at slacklining. You might actually get a gig that pays thousands of dollars for two days, but it's not a living. You're not yeah. gonna make $100,000 a year slacklining. Yeah, and I feel like for me, Unlike some people that do more shows and performances that actually go look to find work, mm -hmm. I've really never done that. I've basically just said yes to opportunities I was interested in that seemed like a cool thing. I've never actually looked for any works or any shows. And I think really to start building that, you need to be kind of wanting that and searching that and making it work. Because at my point, like for me, it's really when I have the opportunity to do something, I look at what it is, it does it interests me and if it does then I'll go for it that's true some people actively look for jobs yeah. Mar I'm... Marcus looks for jobs right. I I don't know jobs kind of come mostly because I hang out with Andy like all I think all the jobs I've ever gotten is because Andy got a job and like hooked me up with being a sidekick right. um, and 
I kind of think that's how the case was of this TV gig that we just did was um, Spencer and Andy kind of did a lot of the legwork for a year or two. Yeah. And then there was 15 of us total that got to say yes or no to the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a tricky, tricky thing, especially in entertaining, entertainment sport like slacklining or shows or like any circus performance or all that kind of stuff. I feel like it's a, it's a tricky one. Do you feel like it's less fun to perform because there's pressure, you don't get to go when you want to go, you have to hurry and wait? I don't think it's necessarily less fun, I think it's just different and I feel like personally I can do so much of that Okay. and it remains fun. But if I had, if that was fully my work all the time, I think I would probably get tired of it. And I think that's why I decided to not go searching for works within slacklining. At this point, I just like said yes to things that were cool and I have enough to get around and do fun things, but not too much to get sick of it. Cause I really slackline cause I like the slackline is basically it. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so China was how, how many weeks? I've, how many times have I been to China? I think I've been to China six or seven times. Do they pay progressively more each time? It depends. I think a few, there was a lot of things and I was never fully involved in the process, in the process of it. I was okay. mostly like contacted later on, like, okay, this is what it is. This is what we're here to do. Do you want to come or not? And be like, yes or no. And I think sometimes it was slightly different companies and slightly different numbers of slack guys. Like you'll get paid a lot more if you're, if you're like three slack gunners yeah. than if you're 30. Yeah. And that's also different. Yeah, big band syndrome. Yeah. yeah. So there's been events, I think we've been like 25 or 30 slackliners and obviously it's a lot of fun because there are yeah. a lot of us who get to hang out and spend time in a cool place. But then there's other ones that are maybe a little shorter and you just two or three people and that will get paid a lot more. Mostly I think because they have a budget that they have to make an event happen and depending on the, the style of event, if it's more of a trick line competition or speed line competition or more like the high heel things I did is... Was, that, was that the high much. heels thing in China? The high heels was in China. Okay. And was that a specific thing where you went went to China to do high heels and come back? Or was it a piece inside of a bigger project there? The high heel one was kind of a two part. There was me, Faith, and Mimi Yeah. that were part of the high heel, which yeah. was just the three of us. And then they had um, Uldus, the French music highline show crew. Mm -hmm. And there were, I think, seven or eight of them, but it was two separate contracts kind of happening at the same time. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did one entertainment thing for Red Bull with Andy. I remember seeing that. Yeah. yeah and it was entertainment based is where we actually got them to slackline the executives and stuff. And right. so it wasn't us performing mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, a lot of, in that situation, we got our expenses covered. Right. Um, you have to negotiate if you have to pay for your own stuff or if you pay for travel a lot of that's built in but yeah ideally a lot of people aim for around 500 bucks a day, a day. that seems like a and then pretty good travel days can maybe be like 500 a day but like sometimes they're not sometimes it's just travel covered yeah um but like i the, feel like that's a good amount to work towards having no less than that yeah in the sport for sure it, it's like if you were to I don't know, I paint houses, and if you got paid $500 to paint a house, you're pretty excited for a day, but you can do that every day. Yeah. You, you can't slackline every day. So mm -hmm. you're like, you would have to do it 200 days a year to make 100 grand, like consecutively. Like, that's su super hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, and not every job's going to pay the same. Uh, the high heels thing got paid more than you walking giant lines, right? For sure. The high heels, was that a giant line? High heels, I think we were, it was like 70, 75 meter, and we walked maybe not from the start because it's kind of hard with the high heels, so we had like an eight or nine meter. I would I would have a hard time walking 50 meters in high heels. I think I could do like a 20 meter, maybe, <laughs> having never tried it before. It's hard. You At first it feels very challenging, and then it becomes easier when you practice it, but it's very controlled foot and tiring for like your ball of your foot and your ankle. It's pretty cool, actually. I imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so things are all kind of over the board with pricing. Um, do you have yeah. any other projects planned that are paid or just cool projects in the future? I have a potential gig with um, Olympic Channel. Okay. 
uh, we'll see if this contract allows me to do it or not. Yeah. But there's a few things that's still up in the air and unknown, especially because of all COVID stuff and travel. Yeah. But we'll see. You can do things for exposure, but you don't want to do that so much to where there's never going to be money. You can't charge $100 for, for a performance and then expect $1,000 the next time, which is actually what you probably need yeah. if you're traveling far distances. Uh, I think the tricky part these days is that you'll always find the slack guy is super stoked that would travel for free because they just want to go, that it's hard to find that right balance of, you know, do you try to push to be paid a bit more for, let's say, China events, or will they just stop hiring you and hire people that will go for free and that's the tricky thing go to the next hashtag slacklining on instagram yeah. and find the next person who's exactly. got a lot of slack pictures yeah so um make sure you value yourself and weigh the options of exposure versus pay versus contracts versus if you find it fun life is short make sure you enjoy everything you're doing even the slack contracts yeah so thank you for sharing yeah